Thanks for joining me. This is Christopher Lockhead, Follow Your Different, where we aspire to have real dialogues, not interviews, as we celebrate the people, ideas, and companies that stand out. We're sponsored by the good people at Oracle NetSuite. If you want to learn how to turbocharge the growth of your business, why not go to netsuite.com forward slash different today. And there, you will be able to set up a free one-hour growth review with an expert in your industry. Check out netsuite.com slash different today. I want to say a special thank you to Sophia Goldberg and the whole team at Data Bird Research Journal. Because they just named us, this podcast, uh, one of their 100 outstanding podcasts. And um, I got to tell you, you know, it's... uh, it's wonderful to achieve these accolades um, or to receive these accolades. It's uh, it is, it's fantastic. And in a world of over 600,000 podcasts, just to be noticed, uh, never mind named an outstanding podcast is, um, is really something. So thank you to the good people at uh, data bird research. And um, I also want to say thank you to you. Um, uh, for listening to this episode, and uh, particularly to uh, those of you who are regular listeners of this podcast. It means the world to me that you hang out with me a couple times a week, and uh, I sure love hanging out with you. (laughs) So, um, you know, thank you for helping us become known so that we can even get a chance to uh, to make it onto some of these uh, some of these amazing lists that we've been put on. So again, thank you, DataBird Research, and most importantly, thank you so much for hanging out with me. Now, on this episode, um, I get to hang out with, and therefore so do you, seven extraordinary people who are on the leadership team of the best year ever blueprint event um, that is produced by my dear friends Hal Elrod. Uh, of Miracle Morning fame, and John Berghoff, John being the uh, founder and CEO of the Flourishing Leadership Institute, and uh, an extraordinary guy in the event world and the facilitation and speaking world. Anyway, um, these seven folks are all part of the leadership team that put on this past year's Best Year Ever uh, Blueprint event in San Diego. And so we got together afterwards and did a Zoom call to have a powerful, no BS conversation. And uh, that's sure what we got. We talk about goals, living a life on purpose, uh, overcoming what stops us, getting clear about our mission. And this is a highly relatable conversation with some very real people as we all grapple with Um, You know, how do we overcome what we want to overcome and how do we get proactive about designing the life that we want? Um, I think you'll get some real uh, actionable insights out of this episode that you'll be able to apply immediately in your life. And uh, I think you'll really enjoy it. So on this call, we have uh, Stephanie Cortelier, Alyssa Dare Nelson, Stephanie Wankel, Rochelle Neiman, Casey Hunt, Linda Merrill, and Klaus Luta. And uh, you're going to hear them in that order. So the first person you'll hear is Stephanie. Uh, Go to Lockhead.com to check out the show notes to get the key takeaways and bios and backgrounds on all seven of our guests today. And now, hey-ho, let's go. Coming off of the best year ever blueprint, um, you know, I run a social enterprise called Integrous Woman and we're, we just hit our one year in November. So we're still very new, Um, but we're a local community in Orange County. And we have, you know, when I started, I had just these big visions and goals uh, surrounding myself. by just really inspiring people. And in, in going to the BYAB, it allowed me the space to, to sit back down and really clarify what are the dreams and the goals for 2019. And what I, what I visualized and through this amazing visualization that John Berghoff did for us, and um, you know, I had already done a co-create event through Appreciative Inquiry with a lot of our members of the community. We had this vision of having just multiple chapters throughout the U.S. and eventually internationally. So a lot of the work that I do supports an orphanage in Guatemala. So I had a, a dream of really so being I, able I hate to interrupt you, but yeah. what's an integrous woman? <laughs> that would be a good start, right? Because I've never heard the word integrous and clearly I'm not a woman. So tell, <laughs> tell us about what that is. Yeah. So um, integrous is just coined off the word integrity. So it's really women who are heart centered. They want to be of service. 
Um, they're leaders in their fields. They do a lot of volunteering or they're affiliated with nonprofits, but we, we come together as a community to, to do local impact. And then we, through all the work that we do, workshops, the memberships, a portion of all of our proceeds goes towards building mental health programs for young teen moms in Guatemala. So every year I do two impact retreats and bring a, a portion of my community to Guatemala to show them how we're building a sustainable model in this orphanage. And, you know, my big vision is that we're doing this in multiple countries with different orphanages around the world. So 2019 should be a, a great year to clarify those goals and really start building processes to scale. That sounds very exciting. So you're the, you're the creator of a do good organization of women. Yes, that's a good way to say it. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, well, that's very cool. And, um, you know, you hear a lot of people who make New Year's resolutions and this kind of stuff. And, of course, I, I saw this recently. I don't know if you guys saw this. I saw it on CBS News that apparently 6% of people who make New Year's resolutions end up keeping them. <laughs> <laughs> and I always, um, I always love, uh, you know, somebody who regularly goes and trains at a gym. This time of year is always an entertaining time of year because there's like in, in the first couple of weeks of January, there's all these faces that you haven't seen before. And the vast majority of them are gone by Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm curious, Stephanie, um, you know, what are the things that you're doing um, to move yourself forward, move your organization forward? And, and in particular, um, you know, why aren't they just going to be? Why are you in the six percent? Let me mm. maybe, let me say it that way. <laughs> You know, it's, for me, it was really the importance of surrounding myself with people who will hold me accountable. Um, it's it, habits. I mean, I, I, I will have a new, I'm sure I'll have a lot of them that don't happen this year, but it's, it's the consistency in it. And it's really getting so crystal clear on your why. And the reason that I even get up in the morning and the, the, passion behind what I do. And I think in my case, it's, it's kind of, it's almost easier because it's for someone else. Sometimes it's a lot easier to do things for other people rather than doing it for ourselves. In my case, I, I get the, the fulfillment and the passion and the excitement when I see the impact I have on, on another woman's life, or in this case, another team mom. So it's, they're the ones who hold me accountable. It's not about, you know, who I'm going to be in the process, though I am growing every single day because of it. It's really the, the impact I get to have on someone else's life and to see that really transform them at the end of the year, which is really powerful. So it's the accountability, it's the community, and it's holding back to the core of the passion in my life. Very cool. All right. Who else wants to share um, what, what's on your mind for uh, making this the best year of your life? I'll go. This is Alyssa. Um, <clears throat> I was really moved by Sean Stevenson when he got up and he was talking about, um, Dr. Sean, Sean Stevenson about, um, uh, it doesn't matter if you actually meet your goals. It's important that you have them. And I've, I've, I've always been a super goal oriented person, but I've noticed in, recent years, especially in the last couple of years that I've gotten shyer and shyer about setting and putting goals out there um, because it, based on really fear of, of failing on them and just kind of getting tired of falling short and feeling that feeling. And um, this BYB was really powerful for me because I came home feeling like, you know what? fuck it. It really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if I meet these goals or not. It matters whether I shoot high. It matters whether I, um, I have the, the why behind it. Um, and that I'm measuring the things that actually matter to me. Cause I've always set a lot of financial goals and like, yes, money is so, so important and on all of that, but it, it's not necessarily my driving force. People are. And so re, calibrating what my goals are actually um, tracking and pointing to um, is just been really exciting as I've come back and for the last few weeks been laser focused on where I'm going in 2019. So I, I have a question for you about that, Alyssa, and, and, and Stephanie mentioned her why as well. Um, it, it's so, you know, life is so funny how things work in synchronicity sometimes. Uh, a, a buddy of mine uh, over the uh, holiday time sent me a note and he said uh, he's been doing some work on his why and uh, he had read um, Simon Sinek's book and 
and he wanted to do some exercises around that stuff. And, um, and he sent me an email and said, Hey, you want to get together and spend an afternoon kind of working on each other's why and doing some of these, uh, these exercises. And yeah, I hadn't done any of, of anything particularly like that in a while. Cause I, I thought I was pretty clear about my why. Um, but I thought, you know what? He's asking the question. I had just come out of best year ever. And I thought, why not look at my why? <laughs> and so with, with that, and so anyway, I did this exercise and I found it very interesting to do with another person, right? They ask you a set of questions. You share some things from your past. You share some things you're thinking. You share some things you're working on, et cetera, et cetera. And then they sort of write in, in, the, in the way he and I did it together. They kind of write a version of your why for you um, mm. to kind of mirror back what they're hearing. And I thought that was a kind of a cool exercise because, well, nothing shocking came out of it for me. Um, it was still fascinating to hear somebody else tell me based on what they thought I said what my why was. So anyway, with, with all that said, I, I'm curious um, why you go to your why as kind of <laughs> uh, a big part of uh, how you think about making this your best year. Yeah, well, in part because uh, going with money goals didn't work. <laughs> so, so that's part of it. And uh, and I got back to what, what really drives me, what really, uh, I, I don't want to say what gets me up in the morning, because to be very honest, the part of the reason I love the Miracle Morning is because I hate getting up in the morning. And um, it wasn't until I read uh, The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins that I actually felt like, you know, maybe it's okay that I hate getting up in the morning. So I hate getting up in the morning, but I love being up in the morning. So anyway, that's a, just a new but what drives me throughout my day is connection with people and for people to feel seen and heard and like they matter and in an actionable way. And so if that's what, what gears me up and what makes me feel that buzzy feeling, um, why not focus my energy on that? Because it will actually propel me into action versus, versus how much revenue have you had this year, which is important, yes, but doesn't doesn't excite me to talk about. Yeah, and I think it, I think it's the same thing with businesses too. Um, in so far as you know, if you're the CEO of a company and all you're ever doing is talking to your people about hitting some financial goal, it's like, well, look, there are certain financial goals that are very cool and exciting, whether it's on the personal level or, or, or on a business level, for sure. Um, but at the same time, it's like, okay, well, you know, we everybody on this call. Everybody is in the top 1% of most wealthy people on planet Earth, right? And yes, we all have financial goals and, you know, more is better than less and, and, and all that. But the reality is um, um, we're all incredibly lucky people. And so um, uh, while financial goals can be very motivating and, you know, I don't diss them at all, but in general, most people are um, not motivated by a financial goal the way they are by some other kind of a goal, particularly a goal around making some kind of a difference for somebody else. Is that is that what you're alluding to? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I've always defaulted to money because it's easy to measure, you know, like changing somebody's life. That's tough to measure. <laughs> and so um, that's one of the things that I've always fought with was like, well, if I back it up and the revenue equals, you know, that I've, I've had some impact on somebody's life, et cetera. And so I've tossed with that a lot. And to be honest, I'm, I still don't exactly know what it looks like to personally change 1000 lives. Like I, I still don't know exactly how I'm measuring that except for sort of releasing it and going, that's my focus um, to be, and, and when, if I stay others focused and just go out to serve, the rest will take care of itself. And maybe it doesn't matter if I have a specific measure on what does that change mean. So are you interested in my feedback about that? A hundred percent, yeah. So I had this aha a little while ago, and I haven't been great about it, but one of my resolutions is to be much better at it. Um, there's this gal... Um, Debbie Sterling is her name. She's the founder of this awesome company called Goldie Blocks. They're STEM toys for girls, STEM being an acronym for science, technology, engineering, and math. And, um, she, and of course, there were no STEM toys for girls. The toy industry said they weren't interested. She said, okay, all of you guys can go F yourself. I'm going to go do this. 
And uh, I don't know if it was Kickstarter. Or it was some kind of a platform like that that because she couldn't get traditional VC funding. Anyway, she's been incredibly successful, so much so that the um, Girl Scouts of America now have a set of STEM badges kind of in partnership with uh, with Goldie Blocks. Anyway, long story longer. One of the things that she said is from the beginning of Goldie Blocks, she has kept every letter every email, every tweet, every whatever from somebody, a parent, a child, whoever saying, this stuff's awesome. It, you made a difference, whatever it is. Right. And I thought to myself, self, you're a moron for not collecting that stuff. And so ever since I've tried to be better. And one of the things I'm really trying to focus on now is any kind of note like that, that I get any email, any tweet, any review of, you know, one of my books or the podcast, anything at all that somebody says something about my work making some kind of a difference to them, I copy it or cut and paste it and just put it in a file. Um, and so um, it's a measure for me, like I, you know, cause they're in, in the world that I live in now, there's book sales and podcast downloads. And a lot of people get really focused on that stuff. And, you know, to your point, Alyssa, measuring shit and revenue and all that is, is, is an important thing. But those of us who are let me say maybe equally motivated or in, in some cases more motivated by those things that are that are harder to measure. Um, you know, where do you start? And so I, I don't know where to start, but I thought when I heard Debbie say that, that's what I want to do. And so I've just started collecting the emails and the tweets and the reviews and all that stuff and just putting them in a in a file. And uh, so when I have my down days or I feel like I'm not making a difference in the world or or I'm a big fat moron or whatever, I can go and look and say, well, you know, look at these emails and look at this stuff and realize, well, maybe I am making a difference in the world. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love that idea. Thank you. All right. Who wants to go next? I'll, I'll, I'll go. All right. This Stephanie. is Stephanie. Um, one thing that really struck me at the best year ever blueprint was when Dr. Sean Stevenson talked about, um, he was talking to his mentor and his mentor asked him, why were you born, Sean? And I, that impacted me so much. Like I'm about to cry already. Um, why was I born? Like I never thought about that. Um, and it kind of speaks to it. Everyone has already talked about about where this drive, um, hunger to have impact on the world and bigger than yourself and your family. Um, previous, my goals have been kind of focused on, you know, my health, my family, career, those kinds of things. But like you just said, not only impact, but um, why were you born? And so as I've been kind of processing that and thinking about how can I apply that to my having the best year ever in 2019, one of the things that came up for me was as I'm thinking about my actual goals and metrics and all those things, my I kind of came upon a theme, which is alignment. So for me, I want to be in alignment with my true self when I make these goals. So an example is um, a goal around health. Um, I'm very active. I did my first half marathon in 2018. I work out a lot, but I'm not, I, I'm not at the weight I want to be. And I'm not at the, I would score my health as like a three. And so I would say that my health is not in alignment with who I am and who I want to be. And so I, in that regard, I decided, you know, that I would really buckle down on making my health in all aspects align with what, what I feel like I, it truly is. And same with like career and if my alignment of who I am with my family is a good mom, then what are the things I'm doing to be in alignment with that? And how are you tasking yourself to kind of measure yourself along these paths? Like, how, how will you know at the end of the year that you are, quote unquote, in alignment? So I took, I took three kind of areas because I could, I get uh, um, over, overwhelmed if I have a lot of areas. So I picked three areas that are really important to me right now. And one was just health in general, being in alignment with my overall health, being in alignment with connection. So being with people that um, bring me up, um, all of those things around relationship and then, um, 
some kind of mission type financial type themes and then I went deeper into each of those and identified it at the end of the year I'm going to know that I was in alignment with those um, if I've done these things. And so are, are there a list of things that you are going to measure yourself against or yeah. Yeah. So I have a list of like on the health aspect, the, the gaps. So I identified the gaps. So for example, I exercise a lot. So that's not on my list because I already do that. So like tracking my macros every day, drinking water, like these are things I'm going to track every day. And every week I'm going to look at how I'm doing and kind of adjust. And that's how I'm going to kind of move through these big themes, but yet have tasks that I'm tracking. Very cool. You know, and there's something else that I, you make me think about, which is a sort of an aha I've had over time, uh, which is if there's, if you think about this concept you mentioned of alignment, imagine drawing two circles, right? There's a circle called um, who I want to be. And then there's a circle called how I actually behave or how I mm-hmm. actually conduct myself, right? And if you're a thousand percent honest, you could draw the how I want to be circle and then you draw the how I am being circle and look at it and go, well, if you were completely aligned, the two circles would just look like one circle on a piece of paper, right? But most of us aren't living there or certainly not living there all the time. And so in a lot of ways, the delta between our happiness and unhappiness is the degree to which we would separate those two circles. So that, that's the first sort of aha for that's me. a great visual too the second aha for me in that regard is you know so if you think about your wellness as an example and you know maybe there's diet things you want to do differently or you know whatever the other things beyond just um uh training and working out are to kind of be where you feel you want to be uh from a wellness perspective the other aha that i've had is if there's something like that in our life that we're not at least moving in the right direction in our own opinion about ourselves. Like in other words, we are stuck for whatever reason. Um, We are sort of admitting to ourselves that we can't handle our own life, right? That we are incapable of designing the life that we want, that we, that there's a part of life where uh, we're not at say in the matter. We're not in control of the matter. And, you know, there's that old Zen saying, you know, what we what we uh, um, what we do in, in one part of our life is what we do in every part of our life. And so there's this other thing for me that I've noticed, which is like part of why I get pissed at myself is exactly what you're describing, Stephanie, which is if there's an area in my life that I want to make some kind of change in and I'm not progressing anywhere near at the level or the speed or whatever judgment I have about myself, that is to say this, there's an outside thing that's stopping me. And then I sort of, I've undermined my life. You know, it's like, uh, we were joking earlier about, uh, about Seinfeld. Um, You know, you want to be the master of your domain, right? You want to be in control. And if you're, if you're don't weigh what you want to weigh, or you're not focusing on your family enough or whatever the thing is, you're saying there's an outside force that's stronger and smarter than you that's stopping you from being the person you want to be. And I don't know about you, but that idea pisses me off more than almost anything else. Yeah, because then you don't have control, right? If that's outside of your control, then you would think you can't do anything about it. Another thing that angers me about it is I keep every commitment to everybody else in my life, and I should keep my own commitments to myself. And it really makes me angry if I'm not doing that and making excuses to not do that is not okay. Yeah. All right, who's next? I'll follow that up. Uh, This is Rochelle, and I can um, really relate to both of um, what everything is, everybody is really saying. Um, But what I really came away with at BYEB is uh, serving a mission instead of serving myself. And I look through that distorted lens to myself as I'm, you know, not worthy, I'm not capable, I can't, I can't, I can't. But when I evaluate it as, is this action serving the mission? 
it suddenly makes it capable for me to do because I'm looking at it through a different lens. And that was a huge um, realization I've made uh, this year is just taking my distorted lens of looking at myself um, off and putting on the lens of I am capable of accomplishing a mission. And so then I can take these actions and evaluate these actions. I'm doing it in a different way. And then another thing that Chris Ducker said was stop comparing your first step to somebody else 100th step. And that's a huge thing for me because I have a huge vision and it's so far away and so scary. And it's bringing that uh, back closer to me. So Hal talks about living your level 10 life. And that seems so far away from me, like I'm not even close to my level 10 life. So what I've been um, trying to change that perspective lately is what's my next level life? And is this action getting me to my next level life? And so it's um, kind of changing the lenses I'm looking through my goals with, like instead of focusing on me and am I a capable, it's am I capable of achieving this goal or this mission or this action to get me to that next step? Yeah, that's very interesting. Isn't it funny how we do compare our first step to, to <laughs> you know, somebody's 20 billionth step? Yeah. And we don't, a lot of times we don't get to see those in between steps. So it just looks like somebody, you know, made all this stuff out of thin air with, they've been diligently working really hard for a long time. Yeah. And we don't always get to I see find, that. I back find this, that we uh, overestimate what we could or should be able to do in a short period of time, but we really underestimate what we can accomplish over a medium or longer period of time. Yeah, absolutely. And we, a lot of times we'll give up in the short term because we um, are uncomfortable or it gets uh, complicated and we don't want to work through that discomfort. And so we give up in the short term when really, if we just pushed through that, that level of discomfort, we would um, accomplish so much more in the long term. Yeah. I had an experience of that today, actually. So um, this morning, my wife, Carrie and I, uh, trained with a new boxing coach. And uh, as we walked out of the gym, or as we we're getting ready to walk out of the gym, the boxing coach sort of almost apologized, said, saying, oh, you know, I thought uh, you folks were going to be more at the beginner level, so I, ho I hope you don't mind that we sort of focused on some of the basics at the beginning of our class. And I said to him, absolutely not. It's always good to make sure your jab is a good jab and your cross is a good cross and your hook's a good hook and all that sort of stuff. And he said, yeah, I didn't realize that you guys were at an expert level. And I started seriously boxing and, and training martial arts about four years ago. And uh, I remember how hard it was in the beginning and how embarrassing it was in the beginning. And, and you know, sometimes it's still embarrassing, but... Um, but I had this moment, uh, uh, Rochelle, where it was like, I, I even said to, uh, to Carrie, I said, wow, you know, that, that, that really means something to me that this guy who's a professional boxer would say that. And what struck me about that was, you know, four years ago, I was a white belt and sucked. And now this guy thinks I'm advanced. And in the overall scheme of things, four years is not that long a period of time. Right. And so it's just interesting how we rip ourselves off sometimes by being critical about what we can achieve in 15 seconds and say, Hey, you know what? If I apply myself to this for a year or for two years, or in this example for four years, you know, I can get to a level where a professional boxer says that I'm an expert. Yeah, and isn't it interesting how it usually takes that external feedback for us to believe it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah which opens up a whole other can of worms. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that Casey. actually plays into, that plays into a lot of what I came away with from the best year ever in that not only do we compare ourselves with others, but I've spent most of my life comparing myself with myself. And I think Hal calls it the, the rear view mirror syndrome where you see, you know, where you have been and you know kind of where you want to go and you see this gap in between. And I liked how you talked about the two circles. And for me, most of my life, those circles weren't anywhere near touching, you know? And so for me, 
the, the best year ever was kind of eye opening in, you know, I'm at the beginning of my journey and I can't be comparing myself to, to Hal Elrod or um, many of the other people that were there at that event. But what I came away with was permission to be myself, permission to um, have my own goals and dreams. And like we've talked about already that whether or not I achieve those doesn't matter, but I need to focus on being able to find that why. And, and as you were talking, you guys were talking about that. I was thinking, you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking of like applying my life in the, the why not sense, like why not eat that cookie? Because, you know, I don't really care what it's doing to my body or whatever. And I wasn't putting the care and attention into those, the self development that I've now been begun on this journey to try and address. Um, anyway, so I'm just excited and it's been already a, a very fulfilling journey as I've transitioned a little bit from not caring and not having a purpose and not having a why into, okay, this is what I want to figure out for 2019. What is something that I can emotionally get invested in and be excited about? And what, what was there some event or what, what was it that made you go from not really caring to use your analogy about the, the cookie versus actually getting conscious about creating the life that you want? Um, it's, well, yeah. Um, so if I'm being open, which I am, am trying to do more, I, I spent half of my life feeding a, an addiction to, to pornography and living kind of in a shell of a life and very selfishly, um, satisfying the, that need, you know, and not taking care of myself. And it caused a lot of problems in my relationship with my wife and my relationship with myself and having this set of beliefs that I, I knew I wasn't meeting. And, um, a couple of years ago I had an experience where I just like knew I needed to stop, right. I needed to make some different choices if I wanted different results. And, and so I've started this journey of, okay, how can I take care of myself? How can I find that purpose? And does that make sense? Yeah. It, you said something that blew me away that I was completely unprepared for, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> how did you realize you had this addiction? It started early. Um, I was introduced, I think, around like age 15. And just kind of, it, I don't know if anybody can relate, but when you consciously choose to give away your choice over and over and again, um, it, it drains you. And ultimately then it's less of a choice that you have, right? Does that make sense? And so from the time I was 15 to, I guess, 32, um, it was just becoming more and more less of me, if that makes sense, where I was being more swallowed up by these habits and, and things that weren't serving me or my family. And what, what made you decide to, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but sort of take this part of your life back or however you might describe it or think of it. Ultimately, um, kind of had a breakdown, you know, I got to the point where it's just like enough is enough. Ended up in the hospital because, um, the stress of trying to live a life that didn't align with what I was, my values, was putting stress on me and trying to lead this secret life ends up weighing you down. And so, um, because of that hospitalization, realizing, you know, I need to do something different or this might be it. Like that might be the end of, of what I do or what I accomplish or, you know, there's not much of a life there. Wow. And if it's not too personal, how's your life now? How's your marriage now? we're tons better than we were, you know, it's, it's definitely something that we're working on. And my wife is amazing. She, she knew about my issues before we even got married and has been willing to stand by me ever, every moment since then. And, you know, it's easy to not, people just give up too easily on relationships and, and that's not who she is. And so having that kind of support is helpful. Um, And so we're a lot better, but there's a lot of pain on, you know, my part hurting myself and her part 
me hurting her that it just takes time to heal. And so we're in that process, but we're a lot better than we were. And we're enjoying this journey where we focus on how can we become somebody different and better. And, and that's a message that has actually kind of inspired me and, and got me excited is we go through these hard things, you know, for me, it was this hospitalization and oftentimes we, we feel like, um, we want to get out of it, right? We don't like it. It's uncomfortable. It's not fun. It's painful. But on the other side of that experience, there's, there's a new person, a new level. Um, I don't remember who was talking about it, but we, we, we have the opportunity to attain a new level. And so being able to push through the hard thing and the challenge to be able to become a different person. And that's really uh, what got me excited is uh, I had heard about the Mor- miracle morning for a long time and finally decided to, to read it and loved it. And it's just gotten me excited to, cause it is to become the, the person that you want to be in order to accomplish the thing that you want to accomplish. If that makes sense. Yeah. It makes a ton of sense. And, uh, you know, thank you for being so candid about it. It's interesting. I, as you're speaking, one of the things that's rolling around in my head is, uh, my friend and mentor Bix Bixin says the true definition of love is being loved for exactly who you are and exactly who you are not. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I don't know who said this, but whoever said this, it's awesome. Uh, around love is uh, true love is when I know the worst thing about you and it's okay. Right. Yep. Um, and that's one last thing I guess that I was thinking of is I resonated with the message that you shared at best year ever that we can be different, that we can be our true selves. We can let that person out and, and I didn't have to hide anymore. Um, for a long time, having anybody else know that I struggled like that was just like the worst thing in the world that I could imagine. And part of what I did was I, (laughs) I reached out on Facebook and just opened up like I am now and said, this is something I I'm dealing with, you know, expecting to be shunned and not loved, but the opposite happened. And there was more of that love and I was able to be myself and to be different and this is kind of inconsequential, but at best year ever, I realized that I like dressing like this, like I'm wearing a vest and my whole life I've loved kind of dressing up and being the best dressed in the room just because it was fun. And so I'm consciously putting effort into, okay, that brings me joy. And really the point, one of the the points of our lives is to have joy, right? If you can't wake up and look in the mirror and say, wow, I'm having an awesome time uh, and doing something that I love. And and to me, this, it's totally simple, but when I put on a vest or a suit coat, it just puts a smile on my face. And that's kind of the beginning, I guess, of what I have to look forward to is to find more things like that, that allow me to, to be who I, who I really want to be. So you're embracing your inner snappy dresser, dude. I am. I am. Yes. I, and you're a handsome I, bastard. So when you get your, when you get your dress up g- going and you're handsome, you really got something going. <laughs> exactly. I love it. It's been fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Casey, anything else? Nope. I think yeah, I'm just excited to what, see what the future brings. So not a boy. All right. How about you, Linda? We need you to un- hear. I'll unmute you. Yeah, you unmute there? me. Yeah, can you okay, hear me? Go ahead. Okay. So, um, one of the things for me from I started actually reading the book, The Miracle Morning, in July, end of July, and already having huge impact with like daily discipline. Um, I've done, like I think I told you before, many things of kind of self-help, but not able to be disciplined through it. So I think one of the things that I came away with even more from the, the weekend was setting those goals, but also the discipline behind them. Um, because I've set goals for years and not hit them, got bummed out, 
depressed, whatever, and then kind of stopped. So for this, from the weekend, well, one from the book, but also from the weekend of being able to break down the goal, the one thing, when we did that, that exercise was very, very helpful um, to be able to break down exactly what I needed to do to move in the direction I want to go. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, the different areas of your life, right? And so one of the things I'm seeing is, you know, we talked about a theme before here, but the discipline in every area is what's the one thing. So, you know, the getting up early and being able to exercise, I actually started running, um, you know, reading Hal saying how much he hates running made me laugh because I hate running. Um, but at the same time, I had these like kind of lies or false things around the running and between Patricia Moreno teaching us kind of how to shift our mind a little bit, embracing our different, you know, and then the goal setting and the discipline, um, you know, yesterday's run, it was cold and I started up a hill and being able to say, I'm overcoming obstacles I made up in my mind to just push through it. And it's only a mile, but it's a mile I didn't run before. And I think, I think it's, you know, again, it's the discipline in each area, whether it's my business, my, you know, my personal business or my, my daily job. I've, I've always been pretty disciplined at my going to work job. Um, but the discipline for my own business and then discipline with my health and with my relationships. So, I don't know. I just, I really feel like all the things I've done kind of came together in the weekend with, uh, Oh, this is how you actually put it together. That's awesome. Pretty powerful. This term has come up a bunch lately in my life. Uh, Hal and John talked to me about it. Um, uh, um, my dear friend and personal trainer, uh, Joey Wolf talked about this. And I think it's a very powerful concept and one that I had drifted off of, which is this notion of a quote unquote accountability partner Mm -hmm. that in the case of training or working out, that if you're working out with somebody or a group of people and they're expecting you to be there and you don't show up, you're letting them down or same thing on a business dimension or a family dimension or, you know, a church or spiritual dimension. if, If you're working in that area, whatever it is. And I, I had realized that even for myself, because I, my goals are different today than they were when I was a younger person, I didn't really think about that. Um, and, you know, when I was younger, I, did, I didn't have that, those words accountability partner, but I did have that concept going for me. But it's been quite some time since I had that. And I realized, you know, in the areas that I want to really break, fo- break through or break, move forward in a meaningful way, hey, I kind of need an accountability partner. And so did did that play into any of this for you? Yeah. So it's interesting because I have different accountability partners depending. Like my brother has run the Boston Marathon. And so he's putting my training program together and being my accountability partner for that. Um, In my business, I'm a Mary Kay consultant. I have an accountability partner there. Um, and actually my husband and I actually started counseling again since the BYEB. So we have an accountability, not only to each other, but that we're going to these counseling sessions to work through our communication issues. So again, it, but it's discipline and being accountable. You're absolutely right. But I have different ones. I have a spiritual director for my spiritual walk. I have, you know, um, so yeah, it's definitely important for sure. Yeah. Very powerful. And one that I thought I had had handled. And then I realized I didn't have it handled at all anymore. (laughs) Yeah. I I actually have found it nice to have a different person for the different areas, you know, that are, so, I mean, yeah, it just kind of helps me, you know, because I'm a a people person and being able to talk to a different person kind of motivates me, I guess. (laughs) And to me, the opposite is also true. If you don't have an accountability partner, and you're trying to hold yourself accountable, it, it falls apart. At least it, it always did for me. I would recommit over and over again to make a change in my life. And it didn't happen until I opened up on Facebook and said, Hey, I need help. Right. And, and that created a lot of accountability. And I love that idea of having one and 
I think we all need that to make a change to the next level. That's true. Absolutely. I totally agree. That was part of my issue before I had my spiritual director, but I didn't have accountability partners in, in other areas. And now I do. And actually, I did start blogging on Facebook, my runs. And that's really helpful because people will cough, comment back. And, you know, like Alyssa said, you know, being able to make an impact in someone else's life, you know, I'm not as young as I used to be, you know, I'm 50 now and it's a, a big, whoa, I'm 50. So, um, other people my age and I'm, and I'm doing these things is inspirational, you know, and I'm doing it for myself, but if I can help someone else at the same time, why not? Yeah, a- Absolutely. All right, Klaus, I think you're up next there, handsome. Cool. It's, it, you know, it, Linda, it's funny. It's almost like having, creating your own board of directors of accountability. You know, if you're a business, <laughs> you have this board with all these different people with expertise. And so line up your spiritual guide and your physical guide and your business guide. And, uh, you know, you can access, I, I'm actually going to implement that. I've been thinking about something similar in terms of accountability. So I'm, I'm, uh, I think I'm going to take that on board. What a cool way to look at it. Yeah. I like that. Board of directors. I like that. (laughs) For me, one of the ventures that I do is this insurance agency that's really kind of a leadership organization. And so for me, I've found that leadership, uh, accountability through leadership is is a good method for me rather than, you know, searching people out and and begging them to, to just drill on me week to week and make me do the things I'm supposed to do which uh, a fitness trainer is really great for. But, um, you know, when I'm held accountable for the results for the the people that I'm leading, that forces me really to take some good action. But um, there was something I wanted to touch on with Rochelle and Casey. It'll come back to me in a second, but I just, I wanted to give a quick shout out to single moms. I don't know if anybody on this call is a single mom, but man, we just got through the holidays I think it's just amazing what single moms do and what you put together and you, you get through these holidays, sometimes on your own, sometimes with the support of family. It's just amazing. And for whatever reason, it, it touches my heart. My parents were married until they both passed away for a very long time. But uh, I don't know how my internet connection here is doing, but with, I think with my dad's got you there for a second. Okay. Yeah. My, well, I was just saying my parents were married their entire lives until they each passed away. But because of my dad's PTSD combined with his mental illness, it was sort of like my mom was a single mom. She was, she had to be a strong woman. And I, I just really love strong women. And I, I think that shines through with single mothers. I don't, I don't know where that came from. It just sort of came out. um, The, uh, the thing Rochelle and Casey were talking about at the BYEB, I remember sitting there and I, w- I was one of the, well, we were all w- one of the leaders and I was standing in the back and I forget who was on stage talking, but I looked over to the side past the audio booth and uh, like Chris Ducker was there and I think Hal was back there. Maybe John was there. Christopher, you, I'm sure you were there hanging out. And I'm like, you guys were like talking and having fun and back slapping. And I was thinking to myself, you know what? I want to be over there hanging out with those guys shooting the breeze. This is, that looks like a lot of fun. How do I do that? And so I like, that was my BYEB realization. I'm like, okay, now I got to become the kind of guy that Christopher Lockhead wants to hang out with. But so then the other thing I was thinking well, of now is, you're on this call. I know it's like <laughs> synchronicity is amazing. I'm so happy. <laughs> and by I, the way, I want to be the kind of guy that Christopher Lockhead wants to hang out with. <laughs> Can we do this monthly? You guys are fantastic. Um, but the thing that I, I, the encouragement I felt in that moment, and it, I give a lot of credit to John Berghoff's facilitation method and his mastery of what he does. But I was sitting there and I'm like, okay, well, I'm not there right now. But all the disciplines I've done for the last two years, all the sales calls I've gone on, all the early mornings I've gone to the gym, you know, all of this stuff that wears on you over time, but also builds you up in a way. I was like, you know, there's no way I could be sitting here even thinking about becoming that kind of person if I hadn't become the kind of person I am now. And I was just like, I was so grateful in that moment that for whatever reason I was inspired. A lot of it was from Hal's book to, to make these changes in my life to, to grow and improve and, and become someone different. Um, and, and then to be at that point and, and kind of have a vision now of, 
of what the future might bring, but, you know, just sort of cast a vision there. Very cool. Uh, now, I have another question for, for all of you folks. Um, it's sort of another thing that has been present for me of late, which is um, I realized that in the areas that I was feeling stuck, that those were also areas where, to the discussion we just had on sort of the accountability partner concept, uh, there were areas where, for the most part, I was going it alone. Uh-huh. And I I had this aha over the holidays coming out of best year ever, which is, hey, dummy, you need to be explicit about asking for exactly the kind of help that you want. And I I sit here today feeling lighter because in the couple areas where I really want to have a breakthrough in my life in, in this year, I have specifically and clearly and explicitly ask for help from people I know who can make a difference for me. And in some cases, it's an accountability type thing, but in others, it's just somebody who can come and, uh, you know, help me out with something that I'm not good at or, or something along those lines. So I'm curious to ask you, have you thought about being explicit about asking for the kind of help that you need? Is that, is that part of the equation in your minds? I know it is for me, Christopher. Um, I actually just asked a friend of mine um, because I have some organizational slash not enough time to do some office work with my business because I do have a second, you know, I have my other job. So um, meeting with her on Saturday, a friend of mine to just go through what I'm looking for and get the help because I want it to stay organized. Um, I want to be able to make sure that I'm reaching out to my customers on a, on a, uh, the right intervals, you know, um, as well as when I have new customers join, um, that they get input quickly into the system, you know, things like that, like office work that I just don't have time for. So it's not necessarily accountability, but it's again, speaking up, I need this. Yeah. Anyone now, else? And what, oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Now I was going to say one thing, the one that's good about this is that it also helps with my relationship to my husband because he feels that I don't organize well enough. So having somebody help me allows that to be freed up to free up the communication between us, that there's not a frustration. Yeah. Like if you suck at organization, like I'm the pot calling the kettle black here on this, then get some help with organization. (laughs) Yeah. I just need somebody to do the stuff that I don't have time for. So it stays organized. Yeah. I I totally, totally agree. I think the act of asking for help requires humility on our part. It requires us acknowledging that we're inadequate on our own. Right. And to me, that is just as important as the action of, you know, then, then having a conversation about that. It's admitting I'm ready for something new and different and I'm not there. So I need help. And I have found that it can actually be a gift to someone else. Um, I, I have lived a life of not wanting to ask for help because I just feel like I'm strong and I can do it. And I have gotten feedback from close friends and colleagues that they, that people want to help. And when you, when you're, when you're humble and vulnerable and you ask for help, it's a gift to them that a you know you're growing in your relationship and admitting things that you can't do everything yourself and b you're letting people help you and grow so i i think it can also be seen as a gift yeah, and also we're not all good at everything right like i'm mostly not good at most things <laughs> i'm lucky that i'm good at a couple things but in the areas that i suck you know to 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 uh, linda to your point on organization I'll give you a simple example. If I'm in the middle of any uh, scheduling coordination, you know, like if you email me and say, hey, why don't we get together for dinner in a couple of weeks? The longer I'm the main person on that email thread, the worse the outcome's going to be, right? <laughs> and so like I know, I need help in that regard. And, you know, I have, I'm married to an extraordinary uh, person and I have an absolutely legendary assistant the world famous uh, Candy Dandy. And and so like I, I have that handled because I'm surrounded by legendary people and I'm okay, you know, with myself and admitting that like 
any of that organization, scheduling, coordination, it's going to go horribly wrong if I'm in it for any you know, anything other than the, begin, the, the opening volley, so to speak. <laughs> I think that's that's such a great point, and we all we all are wired differently, which is why we're in human community, and yet and yet we we think that we have to be independent, and I I think this is one of my pushbacks against our our society as it is right now is that there's this this belief, and we you know push it onto our children in school as well that a you have to be well rounded, and b you have to be independent and to be able to stand on your own two feet et cetera et cetera and those two things are simply not how the world actually functions at its highest and so it's it's unlearning all of that to go oh it's okay and actually does honor somebody else by saying wow i see that you're really gifted at organization or at the details or at this or at that and you know and i'm really great over here with this thing so maybe we can come together and make some magic um and and it really is countercultural. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, hey, if the person who's good at fishing connects up with the person who's good at cooking, we might actually get this thing really going, right? But if the person who's good at cooking is trying to do the fishing and vice versa, and to your point, Alyssa, this bullshit about well-rounded makes me insane because here's what I would posit. There is not a legendary person on the planet who is well-rounded. Right. So right. by way of example, one of my favorite guests ever on the podcast is uh, NBA legend Bill Walton. Right. The NBA says he's one of the 50 greatest players ever. Well, if you want to become one of the 50 greatest players ever, there's no way you're well-rounded. There's mm -hmm. just no way. There's a ton of shit Bill didn't do. Why? He was really busy playing basketball. Right. Right. And you had to get way busy playing basketball to become one of the top 50. And I don't know what the list of things that he's not good at is, but I guarantee you it's a huge one. Uh, one of them's probably football, <laughs> but it's probably a way long list because he got so focused. I remember reading years and years ago. Um, uh, I don't know if you remember the skier, the famous French skier, Jean-Claude Keeley. Mm -hmm. He had a clothing line. And anyway, it was a very big deal for a very long time. Won a whole bunch of Olympic medals and so forth. And I remember reading an interview with him years ago, uh, asking him what it was like when he retired and what were the kinds of things that he did after he stopped competing and skiing. And he said, well, the first thing I did was I wanted to see summer <laughs> because he was in his 30s before he saw summer because he was always somewhere where it was snowing. <laughs> and then the second thing he said he wanted to do was he wanted to learn how to dance. He didn't never he never took a dance lesson. Why? He was taking skiing lessons. <laughs> right. And so my point is, if you're to be legendary and specifically world class at something, by definition, you are going to be uh, imbalanced. You are going to not be well rounded. You are going to be uh, what's the opposite of well rounded. Uh, Perfectly lopsided. Lopsided. Yeah, there you go. Perfectly lopsided. You're going to be very lopsided. The guy could ski. End of discussion. <laughs> right. I always think about it like a like a giant puzzle, like the human race is a giant puzzle. And and so we all have knobs and pokes and weird things, right? Like like a puzzle does. And if we were to take a file and and round all those off, like the puzzle doesn't fit anymore. <laughs> it's all it's all a hot mess. And and so it's just if we just go, hey, yeah, I've got this weird little knob over here, but that makes me special and it makes me unique and it makes me uh, able to contribute to the world in a way that nobody else can. Again, um, what if we, you know, changed that conversation and especially at the, at the child level and told our first graders and our second graders and our high schoolers that uh, it's okay to be um, perfectly lopsided. I just think it would, it would change everything. Well, and just to put a super fine point on this one, Alyssa, um, I, I've for a long time thought that sort of taking the curriculum that most kids go through. And by the way, what do I know about education? I got thrown out of school at 18. But um, 
that saying, hey, you know, equal parts math, equal parts science, equal parts geography, equal parts, you know, uh, art, equal parts choir, whatever it is, right? All the phys ed, blah, blah, blah. Maybe at some age that makes sense. But as a child progresses, we all show a natural uh, uh, draw towards certain things. And we're all, all sort of naturally repelled from certain things, right? The things that we are, tend to be better at, more interested in, and vice versa, right? And so um, we've had Dr. Uh, Daryl Treffert on the podcast twice. He is um, a psychiatrist in Wisconsin. Um, just outside of Winnebago, and he's considered um, the world's leading authority on autism, acquired savantism, and genius. He was the consultant they hired to uh, consult to the, the, the producers of Rain Man to make sure it was authentic. A very, very serious guy. He's written some books. He's been, you name it, he's been on it 60 minutes. He's, he's all, you know, and he's an incredible man. I mean, just a gigantic heart. And they have a, 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 a center there where they teach kids with autism. And, uh, and so he shared with me how they do this. And one of the approaches they use, and these are his words, is a strength-based education model. And I asked him specifically, I said, do you think this is just appropriate for autistic kids? And he said, absolutely not. That he believes that the right path for the future of education is a quote unquote strength based model where as we grow up and look, there's a certain amount of geography and a certain amount of math and a certain amount, you know, th there's a base level of things we want people to learn and history and of, of course, of course, but at, at a certain point, as we start to excel in phys ed or math or chemistry or whatever it is, right, that why would you, if you say there's 15 things that a child gets trained in over time in education, why wouldn't you, as the, as the child grows and shows a direction, why wouldn't we double down on the three to five things or the two or three things that child shows real strength in and maybe has a shot at being world class in and even if they don't have a shot at being world class in maybe they just like it yeah i love that i'm a strengths based coach so <laughs> this that makes me so happy to hear that there's there's someone sort of spearheading that that idea <clears throat> i think too uh, giving some autonomy to the kids like i i totally agree our education system is kind of backwards but give some autonomy to the kids and let them pick instead of telling them this is what you have to know and this is the well-roundedness you have to fit within you know give that choice earlier on so that they can kind of have that you know play to their own interest and strengths amen hallelujah all right anyone else have anything they want to add on on what you're up to in terms of trying to make this your best year Do books count? Yeah, books way count. I don't know. Last time I checked, there was a lot of smart shit in at least some books. You know, I, I read so many books, and I love reading. I, I, I've always loved reading. And, uh, and there's always been this thing in the back of my mind. I know I've wanted to write, and I want to write prolifically. I, wanna, I want to have many books so that 30 years from now, people say, wow, Claus, he really wrote a lot of books. I, I guess that's what I'm going for. But... There's been this, Have this you block. Have any books, Klaus? I did. I wrote a little, a little um, e-book that I published that was on a financial, a very specific financial product. And uh, after rereading it a few times, it wasn't really up to my standards, so I pulled it off of Amazon. But So I have written that. But now the real work is coming, at least the first work, so that I can get to my second work. And, uh, and the, the end of the year event inspired that. I have my mind map somewhere over here. I read Chandler Bolt's book on the flight home, got home, kit, put the kids to bed that night, and then went down in the basement here and, and worked on my mind map. So I have the concept out. I'm working on the outline. The interesting thing is that it's, it's, uh, my subject matter is going to be geared, Alyssa, you'll love this, towards the strengths-based learning approach to life and how that, that fabric can interweave with your life and just improve all aspects of it. It's going to be a real page turner. I can guarantee it. But um, I'm just, I'm excited about that because the event inspired me to get on that. And I have a deadline of summertime. So this is, with everything else in my schedule, this is going to be one of those 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. books that I write. But that's on the agenda. So look for that. We'll, uh, I'll be promoting the, the shit out of that later. 
That's I'm pretty awesome. sure we all walked away from BYEB going, yeah, 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 there's more books than me. I, I've got three that are that are on my docket for this year. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I, you know, I really, uh, as a guy that never thought I'd write anything um, and now have two books out, I think if you feel like you have a book in you, one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself, forget the, the world, hopefully it's a gift to the world too, but one of the greatest gifts you can give yourself is write that book. Yeah. And I love I love Chandler's talk at uh, at best year ever, um, and uh, I love the fact that he put up his Wells Fargo account and showed that what was it four or five years ago he was uh, had this horrible negative net worth and now he's making zillions of bucks as an author and teaching people to be an author and I don't know he to me he looked like he was about sixteen years old. <laughs> So I just love to see young people killing it. And I just, his talk about raw uh, transparency when he, when he says, this is where I started with this terrible Wells minus in his Wells Fargo account. <laughs> All right. Anyone else have anything they want to add? No, just if you haven't been best year ever that any, I, I can't stop talking about best year ever. So I, hopefully they haven't sold out of tickets because I'm <laughs> recruiting all of Minnesota to go to go with me next year. <laughs> it's I, I epic. It. And I guess uh, uh, selling best year ever in San Diego as a December event to folks in Minnesota, you got that benefit. Going yeah, for it's it, right? brilliant. <laughs> it's, it's in the bag. <laughs> all right. Any anyone else before we uh, before we wrap? I'll just second Alyssa's statement of um, if you haven't gone to Best Year Ever, check it out. It has been an entire life transformation, or at least the beginning of an entire life transformation for me. So I'd highly recommend it. The other thing, let me just ask you this. You know, as somebody who, particularly earlier in my life, I did a lot of what you could call personal development training stuff. Um, and then I got very busy doing my life and I didn't do very much if, if any of that stuff for a very long time. Um, and it's only been in recent years that I've sort of come back and revisited some of this stuff. Um, the, the thing for me about best year ever and particularly about John and Hal is, um, with all the awesomeness, there's also, and I say this with tremendous love, there's a corniness to them, <laughs> right? It's oh, yeah. corny. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> right, like John's playing the drum. The, 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 he, you know, he travels with that giant bongo, congo, dongadongo, whatever that thing's called. He travels with funny. that fucking thing. Yeah, everywhere he goes. <laughs> yeah, he was. He recently visited me. He it was so funny. He sent me this text, and he said, "What are you doing tomorrow afternoon?" And as you guys might know, he lives in the Cleveland area. And the minute I saw the text, I thought he's coming to California. <laughs> I said, "Why are you coming here?" And he said, "Yeah." because <laughs> his folks live here anyway so he shows up at my house the next afternoon with his son who by the way his name is ace he has a son named ace like on his birth on her on his birth certificate it says ace <laughs> but i digress awesome. and so he shows up with ace a backpack ace's backpack and this giant fucking drum <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, oh there's gosh. something they don't take themselves seriously. And there's something, you know, if you compare it by way of example to a Tony Robbins event. And I, and I got nothing but good things to say about Tony Robbins. I'm not a Tony Robbins guy per se, but but I think he's done a lot of great things in the world. But my impression is that sort of stuff is very polished, very buttoned down, very precise. And, you know, you go to uh, you go to best year ever blueprint and there's brother James singing these songs. And like it's there's something I don't know if down home is the right word, but do, do you know what I'm getting at? Yeah, authentic. it's very authentic. Yeah, authentic. Yes, <laughs> yes. They had a they had a quote last year. It was literally, I have it literally in front of me. It's get rid of trying to be perfect to be authentic. And I absolutely, that's the reason I absolutely love everything about BYAB. It's the people are real at the end of the day. Yeah, it's not very, uh, I don't know if you remember this expression. I remember this when I was younger. People were putting on airs. Right. You heard that expression. Right. It's yeah. sort of the opposite where we're like, there are definitely no attempts at putting on here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's anything true. else before we wrap, folks? No, I just want to say thank you, Christopher, for allowing us to be honest with you and just letting us share. Yeah. Thank you very much. Fun. Good to see everyone. Well, thank you. I really appreciate being part of this community. I really appreciate that you guys want to jump on uh, and do this with me. And um, 
you know, I think I love it as much as you do. So I, th- I thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. you. Yeah. Stay legendary, my friends. <laughs> <Okay>. You too. <laughs> Whew. I hope you enjoyed that dialogue as much as I did. Now, um, is it grow time for your business? Because my friends at NetSuite want to help you grow. Check out netsuite.com slash different. And um, when you go there, you'll be able to set up a time to schedule a free one-hour growth review with an expert in your industry. And that's because NetSuite wants to help you master your growth. Now, if you think about um, something like order management, it's critical that you're able to streamline the whole order process. I mean, number one, you want to be able to take those orders. You want to be able to connect your order management system, your inventory system directly to work with your website. You wanna be able to prevent errors across the entire process uh, and have a smooth flow from uh, sales quoting to order fulfillment to timely invoicing and ultimately, of course, to receiving payment. NetSuite's order management and billing management capabilities integrate your sales, finance, and fulfillment teams to improve quote accuracy, uh, eliminate billing errors, strengthen revenue recognition, and drive fulfillment and accuracy across the entire order management uh, chain, if you will. It's a very powerful set of capabilities. And uh, it's one of the reasons that over 40,000 high growth, small entrepreneurs have picked NetSuite as their platform. So if you're ready to get your business growing, go to netsuite.com slash different and set up your free one hour growth review today with an expert in your industry. Also, if you want to communicate, uh, you can send us email, blackhole at lockhead, two H's, L-O-C-H-H-E-A-D dot com. And you can find me on Twitter and um, Instagram at lockhead. All right. We would like to thank the amazing folks behind the best year ever blueprint this year in San Diego, December 13 through 15, 2019. Check out best year ever live dot com uh niche down by heather clancy and myself the number one bestseller how to become legendary by being different why not pick up a couple hundred copies today <laughs> the good folks at one life fully live.org this is the amazing nonprofit trying to help you dream plan and live your best life the number one life fully live.org um, now, speaking of growth, if you're an entrepreneur, you work in, a, in an entrepreneurial business, check out the new place uh, for entrepreneurs who want to grow on the internet, growwire.com. There you'll find amazing content, uh, some of it even written by myself and Heather Clancy. Uh, you'll find an amazing uh, YouTube channel, podcast, and much more for stories innovation. Check out growwire.com. Now, um, are you under the bus? Would you prefer to be driving the bus? Maybe it's time to think about a virtual assistant. That's right. Check out Bottleneck Virtual Assistance at bottleneck.online today where you can discover the power of a virtual assistant to help you get more stuff done in your life. A podcast that I love, Culture Eats Strategy, with my friend and the producer of this podcast, none other than the nicest man in podcasting, Jamie J. Check out Culture Eats Strategy. Now, are you in the B2B space in Silicon Valley? Do you want your uh, website to represent your company just the way your best uh, spokesperson or salesperson does? Then check out Atrenet, A-T-R-E dot N-E-T. These are the folks that have been building world-class B2B websites in Silicon Valley for decades, Atrenet. And another nonprofit that I love, the good people at the Front Row Foundation. Check out frontrowfoundation.org. These folks work with people who have, in many cases, life-threatening illnesses to give them an experience that they will never forget. Check out the frontrowfoundation.org today. All right, I need to remind you that this podcast is the sole property of the Lockhead Oddcast Network, and we would love it if you shared the shit out of it. All rights do remain disturbed. We must warn you that this podcast is clearly produced, clearly in a studio that does contain nuts. Don't forget to teach entrepreneurship. Go for your goals no matter what, because <laughs> if you don't, who will? Uh, in the event of a water landing, this podcast can be used as a flotation device remember there's no stopping the cretins from hopping don't be lame get out of the passing lane listen to lyle love it 
Remember, if you haven't changed your mind lately, how do you know you have one? Thank you so much, Candy Dandy. I love you, Mom and Dad. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Richard C. Kelly, chairman of Pacific Gas and Electric. Sorry, Dick, we just ran out of time for you. That's it, my friends. I really appreciate you investing part of your life with me. And uh, till next time, follow your different.